Hi guys, thanks for tuning this episode of Nick Egan Times. On this episode, we have an awesome guest. We have Phil Fonnelly. Phil is an English producer and songwriter. In the 1970s, Phil worked with The Jam and Paul McCartney. In the 1980s, he worked with Ecstasy and Duran Duran and then joined The Cure. In the 1990s, he co-wrote and produced Natty and Rulia's Evergreen hit Torn. In the 2010s, he played bass for Brian Adams. After decades of making records for other artists, Phil started making his own under Astral Drive. Astral Drive is a combination of 70s recording techniques, impromptu jam sessions with himself, and starry-eyed idolism. It's now been three years since Astral Drive's debut release, and now Phil Connolly raises the bar with a new 11-song follow-up, heavy with soulful harmony vocals, heartfelt singing, lush chords, and optimistic stargazing lyrical themes. Welcome to Multi-Talented Phil, and thanks for coming to my podcast. Hey, Nick. Thanks for having me on. And hello to everyone across the world, especially in Sydney. Woohoo! <laughs> there we go. How's um, how's the how's it all been going over there? And how's I guess the pandemic too, personally and professionally, affected you? Yeah, yeah. It um, because I'm at the kind of I guess you could say the fag end of my career. Um, in some respects, um, not being the youngest. When 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 um. The pandemic really hit here in the UK. I was lucky enough to um, go back to my hometown, and um, and for once the weather was fantastic. So there was this strange, although obviously there, there was the, the nightmare, the hospital hospitalizations, and, and and the drama and the panic. But at the same time, I was able to kind of, um, with my partner Julie and her dogs. We were we were kind of out in the countryside, isolate like literally isolated because it's farmland, and um, I spent every day cycling and, you know, um, so in many respects uh, I had a very that, that first year last year twenty twenty was was actually quite um, was actually quite peaceful, um, so uh, and now it, uh, I'm back in London and I think. Um, we're kind of gearing up for possibly, you know, and I don't know if there'll be another lockdown. I would imagine something pretty dramatic is going to happen again as, as the cold weather kicks in. Um, that's, that's the feeling I get that there's a lot of optimism about, you know, maybe we're learning to live with it, but whether or not, um, whether, you know, I think there's a few more fences to jump over yet and and uh, you still have to obviously i live in london as you know like sydney you know a pretty dense um urban and i still walk down the middle of the street you know i try and avoid people we still there's a lot of relaxation here of uh, the masking up or whatnot uh, even on uh, public transport but um i mean people are supposed to wear the mask but um that's we're, we're discovering that you know that um, personal freedoms, people's own opinions are, are now coming into play much more. But um, yeah, so it's been a strange couple of years. But professionally, um, it allowed me to um, finish recording this uh, other Astral Drive album um, because I just suddenly had lots of time, and, you know, to 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 work on it and. Um, Oh, so so that's what I did. I concentrated on it. And um, yeah, very pleased with the results. Some respects, all that sunshine that I know you're used to that in Sydney, but um, over here, it's a rare commodity. And that kind of, I felt like that, that um, if you like, uh, had a positive effect on the songs, made them kind of very, yeah, reflect that kind of sunshine and trying to stay positive in the middle of the of this uh you know the worldwide pandemic yeah that's um, really insightful yeah definitely mm. um all right let's go back let's go back to obviously your story of how it all began for you so when you were young talking about your family um and life growing up for you um when i was um i guess when i was about 12 or 13, um, I picked up a guitar. My brother had tried playing guitar and, and uh, didn't persevere with it. And I picked it up and did persevere with it and uh, immediately started writing songs. It was like the 
I don't know where that came from, but it just happened. I, I learned three chords, started writing songs, and um, had some very musical neighbors in a Italian American family who were really basically they taught me music um, because they were very musical. And um, then when I was 18, um, my mum, um, bless her, r realized I was a, a bit of an academic no, no hoper. And uh, through some contacts, got me a job as an apprentice in a London studio. So at eight, 18, I left school and started working in the, in the proper music business, which is, def which is different to actually enjoying music and being in music. When, when you're in the music business, obviously you're getting paid to do something and that's uh, some disciplines you have to learn. But um, yeah, I was super passionate about it and I still am, I still am, yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Um, tell me about Astral Drive um, and the journey with that specifically. Okay, so, um, this would relate to, I, I, I was a teenager in the 70s and, you know, for everybody, you know, in their teenage, I think um, music is very powerful. You know, it's the soundtrack of our lives, to use a cliche. But uh, uh, for me, um, obviously going into music, the, the, the music that in, inspired me, which was a lot of kind of um, things like Pink Floyd, there was an American artist called... Um, Todd Rundgren, there was the Beatles, of course, there was soul music. And um, when I got to um, kind of the end of my songwriting producing career and started making the Astral Drive records, that's what I, I, I was free to do anything I wanted to do. You know, nobody, I wasn't signed to a deal and I was just making music for the fun of it. So I reverted back to all those influences from the 70s that um, I guess you could say it was indulgent, you could say it was nostalgic, but it was actually very, um, to me, it was organic and it, and it, and it was, um, you know, it was kind of pure because I was going back to the roots of how I'd learned how to play music, the chords, the type of songs, the, the singers that inspired me. And um, so Astral Drive became this, in some ways, a kind of um, for anyone who was a teenager in the seventies, they kind of get it because it's nostalgic for that t those times. But hopefully, fresh songs and um, a kind of um, the lyrics are a, a kind of stargazing, you know, a bit idealistic. You know, when you're a teenager and you think, "I'm going to change the world," and um, so that's reflected. It, it generally in in all the songs across the two albums that um it's it's i'm i'm singing it's almost like i'm now 61 and if you reverse that at 16 I, but i'm singing songs like i'm 16 again i think that's the nicest way to put it it's like um there's still part of me that's that's that uh kind of idealistic person that uh um yeah, but it, uh, but it's not. Um, I suppose my career in the music business, you spend a lot of time contriving things. Um, you know, a record company comes to you and say, "We want a song for, um, like, for instance." Um, there was an Australian artist called Shannon Knoll, who's who's a big hit. Uh, you know, maybe twenty years ago, fifteen years ago, and in that instance, re that his record company came to me and said. You know, we need some songs. It needs to be a bit like, maybe a bit like Brian Adams, but Poppy, he's got this this kind of rock voice. And um, so the professional in me then goes, okay, um, you know what sort of chord changes to use, you know what sort of lyrical themes might be suitable. Um, so in, in, even though you're loving making the music, the, the, there's a kind, there is a contrivance to it. That's why you're a professional because you can kind of turn on the tap and go. If somebody came to me and said, "Can you write a song like ABBA?" I would think about it for you know a, a week or so, and um, and listen to the records, and then you kind of get an idea of the sorts of 
style that it would be. Whether I can actually write a song as good and, as good as ABBA is, of course, pretty much impossible. Only those guys can do that. But um, so, <clears throat> from the one hand, being able to contrive uh, music for p pop singers, which I made a living from, and I'm very happy to as well, then this Astral Drive record is sort of the opposite of that i don't i don't really contrive it i just kind of in a hippie way just kind of let it happen and um it's it's very fulfilling to be um at this stage of my career and kind of go like wow that's all still there all that stuff i learned all the stuff i loved and it comes out as this um as this you know idealistic and hopefully melodic and um moving emotional music you can be the judge of that nick oh man i think it's amazing and yeah i think yeah. Yeah, you're incredible um i actually listened to a couple of them and yeah it's really good like it's spot on what you said so well done yeah, yeah i think it's yeah, i think it's amazing thanks i try my best <laughs> yeah. tell me um about the songwriting too that that's really interesting how what makes a good song so for example even with natty and bully uh, i know that you co-wrote that um torn talk to me about that like what how do you get the inspiration what actually really specifically drives it um often um you know because you're a professional and you the, the only way you can um continue to succeed in the music business in any business is if you if you can find some success success and in the music business that means having hit songs either writing them or uh, producing them and uh, if you don't have hits for a few years the music business kicks you out of the door so that's the kind of drive to, uh, well was back the, back then um you know torn was written it's got a very long story um uh, which i'll try and keep short um there were three writers on the song that was myself uh, and previn and scott cutler and uh, we were actually making a demo tape for Anne um to you know sell herself as an artist to record companies and so the song was about in a bunch of five or six that we wrote in an attempt to get her a record deal and um so uh and initially you know she didn't she, she wasn't successful um as a solo artist no nobody was particularly interested in the song it's amazing to think that um and ended up re kind of um I suppose repackaging sounds a bit uh, cold but uh, she ended up make becoming part of a band a kind of cool grungy band that did the song um that did the song torn and then that got record companies interested because that was around a time where that was um you know it's sort of a few years uh, past grunge but people wanted still wanted that kind of uh, rocky sound something perhaps a bit more real um obviously when we made um natalie's version which was probably the fifth or sixth version of that song recorded it was um it uh, we kind of distilled it into something that was very good for suitable for um, radio stations across the world you know it's like a hit in america hit in australia hit hit in the uk um there's a combination of natalie's like you know beautiful tone her singing tone and then somehow that managed to let the song reach you know so many people and if i knew how to do it again i would have done that again i've, I've come close a few times but um with that song um you can write a song in many different ways you can for instance now i tend to write a set of the piano and um just let like inspiration comes through your fingers you find a few chords you start singing you know kind of like nonsense and then um sooner or later you, you go like oh what was that that sounded good so that's one way of writing it when you're by yourself with the guitar and um the other way is which the way torn was written is when you sit down with two two other writers one of them maybe the artist 
and um, you try and trace, you try and sort of chase down a um, uh, the sort of song that you think is going to suit the sing the artist's voice. That's really important. It's got to suit the artist's voice, and it's also going to suit the market. You know what's on the radio right now. That's that's pretty important. Or or um, what's about to be on the radio. You know, there's a few things in play that you you try and judge. Like I say, the singer's voice. Where where is the singer? Where where do they sound really good? Where's the point in their voice? Like are they, are they do they need a ballad or are they are they a powerful singer or are they more of like a poetic singer, perhaps like Natalie that needs something more subtle, um, and then you've got to tailor the the lyrics so that hopefully they're original. But they're, you know, they touch on themes like love or romance or betrayal or heartache. You know, these are, it, it, most songs you hear on the radio are to do with those themes. And you just have to um, see if you can find something original in that, in that area. So there's those two different ways of writing songs. There's the more um, organic, perhaps, uh, way where you write by yourself or say Lennon and McCartney used to write sitting each opposite each other, just exchange ideas and, and uh, build an idea into a song or the, the other way that, that Torn was written where there's three writers um, being quite intense and being professional. And then somehow sometimes the magic happens and the public go, we love that record. We love that singer. We love that artist and uh, it'd be, uh, be either buy it, stream it. And for, from a pro professional point of view, if you get one of those hits, then that means your career can last for another few years until the next one. So it's, it's pretty, it's pretty, you know, music business is pretty, um, well, I guess it's like any business, you know, it's cut, it's not cutthroat. That sounds too dramatic, but you, you know, you got to come up with the goods. You got to keep giving people something that they're interested in or, um, or they'll show you where the door is and, um, uh, bye bye. So I did that for pretty much for maybe 35 years. Happy to do it. Loved it and kept getting lucky with a hit every now and then. Um, somehow and i still love music that's an incredible thing to come out the other side and still still be um pas feel passionate about it and um interested in it there's so much it's just it's it's just a mystery to me i'm i'm, I'm, I'm an uneducated musician i taught myself pretty much and um i think even if i was educated there's still more to learn different composers different ways of writing you know, uh, um, culture keeps pushing forward new types of music and and um, there's always something to learn. You know, I, I particularly, I have kids, so I've been exposed to, you know, um, Kanye West or Frank Ocean or cutting edge artists. And initially you go like, wow, I, I, I don't get that. Well, but you hear it a few times and, and then you start realizing, well, yeah, that's an there's something very powerful about it that's completely opposite to the music I loved, completely opposite to the music that my parents loved, and the revolution continues. And let, let's hope it keeps doing that. It's really, really insightful. And, yeah, it's incredible, your career. What has been um, – actually, what's – when the hit, for example, Torn hits the radio stations and it gets on the charts, what's that feeling like that you know that you – processing co-wrote that you know that must be an incredible feeling it, it is um i i still get chills if if i was to hear torn on the radio now or any of my songs then um it's sort of weird really because you think you would get you might get blasé about it but um it's still i if i feel like i'm 14 again and i'm going like what they're playing i wrote that it's on the radio, you know, there must yeah, be something yeah. wrong. Um, it's a buzz. 
I don't know, maybe if you, if, if you play soccer or, you know, like you're a striker or something and you score a goal, you know, in an important championship, it's, it's such a, it really is like has a physical effect on you. You, you, even though you're professional and you're going like, yeah, I do this as a job. It's the kid and you comes back again and you go like, wow, it's, it's, um, if you could bottle that feeling up, then um, it would sell well. But, and you know, maybe that's why you keep doing, um, wh why I keep trying to write songs is because I'm still searching for that high. Um, you know, when even your mum or your grandma is going, oh, I heard your song on the radio today. Um, it's, it's, it's an amazing communication. Um, to think that you've reached so many people. Um, I often talk about, uh, you know, when you have a home studio and you work away at producing records, writing songs, and all the time, people used to have, say, transistor radios in, the, in their kitchen, you know, but the kids before they go to school would put on the radio and listen to, you know, like the pop station. And it's almost like I spent my whole career trying to I, i'm sitting in front of a couple of big speakers right now and uh, you sit here and work on the song but what you actually want to do is make it not come you want the, the music to come out of the transistor radio speakers you want to make it come out of your kitchen speakers you know when the radio plays it when the tv is playing it um not so relevant today because now everybody's streaming it's got iphone or you know, have, have their own playlists. But uh, when radio stations were strong, it was, um, that was a great feeling. Yeah, and, and it's, it's still, it's still a great feeling. It's, yeah, it's, it's a good, it's a, it's a very positive high. That's really impressive. Mm -hmm. What, what are, um, some of your favorite artists that you've worked with that really stand out for you in your career? The artists that I've worked with um, that I really um, respect, and I guess because you're a professional, you work with all sorts of different artists, and 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 you respect all of them. You you, you try and bring your your Eddie game to to each record or song that you write, but there are occasionally ones where um, obviously I've worked with Brian Adams for twenty years. Um, writing songs with him, producing him. Occasionally I've been in the band. And um, there's something about his, um, you know, most people know his voice. He's got this incredible voice and it really is. Um, he's maybe, you know, like a, a, of the top five singers that I've worked with, he's definitely in the top two. I'm not going to reveal who's number one. It might be me, but no. <laughs> um, I, wish, I wish I had his voice. It is just... And especially if you were in the room with him when you're writing the song, he's he he, um, he has a way of singing that's so um, he can almost like he he's obviously got this sort of rock sound, um, this kind of raspy throat, but um, he brings such feeling to a song. He's um, say you write a song and uh, which we we've done you know we've written twenty or thirty. Um, and you come to do the vocal, you know, like to do the, maybe you're just making a demo of it and you go, okay, let's, let's sing the, let's sing the lyrics that, um, he'll sing the song three times and each time it will feel like it's about something completely different because he's like an actor, you know, I guess with the way, the way he sings. So he's really impressive, really impressive to work with. There was a singer in the 70s um, who's now passed on, who is a um, kind of a folk, uh, it's, always, it's quite trippy too. He's called John Martin. Phil, Phil Collins, you know, the famous Phil Collins produced a couple of John Martin's albums. And um, he's a very troubled soul, you know, um, was quite quite dark just had the voice that was um you know you would be uh, when you're in the studio recording albums usually the singer is sing, singing along as a guide 
for the drummer and the bass player and the piano player to, so they know where they are in the song. But with John, um, when he sang along, that's what ended up on the record. You know, like when he wasn't trying, he was amazing. And when he was trying, he was just like unbelievable. Um, and th th this is a gift that not many people, you know, it's like Ronaldo or Messi or they just have this X. They really do have an X factor. And, and like everybody who appears on the X factor, who, um, you know, they really have something that you, you, it's like a, a one in 10 million talent that uh, they're able to communicate. So John is no longer with us. Brian, of course, is still touring. Um, and um, let's see, Darren Hayes from Savage Garden, one of, um, you know, Australia's biggest exports. Again, super impressive, um, not only as a singer, but as a songwriter. Um, I could tell you, uh, we've written songs together and he has a particular, you know, very unique sounding voice and um, is able to, he writes a set of lyrics for a song, which if, if, if I had to write those lyrics, it would take me a, a week to think about them, another few weeks to edit them, you know, to perfect them. And he does it in like 20 minutes. This oh. goes here, here it is. And you go, Jesus, how did you, excuse me? You know, like that's, that's some kind of talent. Um, Another person who I love working with is uh, there's a band called the New Radicals who had a big hit, but 20 years ago called "You Get What You Give," and he's similar to Darren. His name is Greg Alexander. He has this uh, one of those people like Brian, like Darren, who just um, their talent is just um, yeah, it sounds kind of bland to say awesome, but. Um, occasionally you know as a professional everybody works hard we're all trying our best occasionally someone walks into the room and just kind of does it without trying and you go you bastard mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah that's a little roundup of the people that i've worked with that i, I found um particularly impressive i guess of uh, you know um the, the, there have been plenty of other singers that, that I've worked with, Pixie Lot, Natalie, um, that um, I could I could also mention. But um, yeah, the, 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 that's in my career. The people who I've come across, where where where, where you you know their jaw, their talent is jaw dropping. You go, this is going to be easy, <laughs> no. yeah. So, but um, um, I guess. The fact that some people find it easy, there are also other artists you, who you work with who, who um, you know, they mean it just as much and um, it can just sometimes take a bit more work to get a finished record with them than the, than the other names I've mentioned. Wow. So it's all part of being a professional, you know. Wow, that's incredible. What are, what are some of your key learnings, I guess, from your career? What are... What are, yeah, what are the things that you've learned that really stand out for you? I think uh, this is yeah, a dangerous question there, Nick, because um, I think the one, th one thing I've learned from my career is that um, um, it's good to say I don't know every now and then. You know, some people can pontificate. I have a lot of ideas about songwriting and how to do things, but at the end of the day, I'm just doing, I'm doing my best. Um, I'm passionate about it. But um, if I really knew what I was doing, I'd be having, you'd be singing my songs like ABBA songs or like the Bee Gees songs, you know, the, the Beatles or, you know, um, there are some people that seem to really know what they're doing. So it's dangerous if I kind of, um, it's, if I don't want to give the impression um I suppose that, uh, that that's what I've learned through my career is there's always more to learn. There's always more to learn. There's always more to be excited about. Um, you know, I'm lucky to be healthy. So, so, um, that's, that, that, 
but I guess there's, there's always, you're always thinking maybe this song, you know, this one could be the one that, that, uh, is, is another hit like torn, but, um, yeah, just, just kind of step back every now and then and go like, I think I'm, I think I'm pretty good, but I'm no great shakes. You know, there's more to learn. There's more to do. Awesome. What, um, what's the best advice you've received in your career? Hmm. Um, I had a boss, uh, when I started working at, at, at um, age 18 at this uh, studio complex, there were three or four studios and the boss was a really successful, the guy who owned, um, the studios, he owned a record company, publishing company. He was an entrepreneur, you know, an empresario. He was kind of like, um, you know, the way people see Simon Cowell today, you know, someone that really understood the whole machine. And his name was Mickey Most. He's he's not, he's sort of the person, maybe your parents would know the records he made with the animals, Hot Chocolate, The Hermits, Donovan, Lulu, Kim Wilde, you know, he had a really successful career. And um, one thing he could do was... Um, spot a hit song he could you know 10 writers would come in for a meeting during say during the day and if that if and they would play him his new their new material and um he was just had this magic ability to find a, a song that was suitable for the right artist and in a few weeks time it'd be on the radio so the one thing he always i worked as as his assistant for two or three years and so I learned quite a few things from him. Usually, um, to get back to your question, he would say, just turn the singer up. You know, it's, it's so when you get into record production, you hear people talk about, wow, oh, amazing drum sound. Listen to that guitar sound. But people just really want to hear the lyrics and they want to hear the singer. And I suppose you could say they want to hear what the, story of the song is and if 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 anything that you're producing gets in the way of that you know if you if if say you've got a guitar player who who plays across every time the singer starts singing starts playing across it that's not a good that's like you have to kind of um make records that uh frame the singer so at least people listening have a chance to go like well that's shit or I love it. But at least they, it's obvious what you're trying to do. Um, and it's not being covered up by any other, um, any, any other elements. So, uh, yeah, that's the best advice. Like keep turning the singer up, um, um, make sure, obviously it helps if the singer sings in tune and sings in time. That's another part of a producer's role is to get the singer to perform, um, to, you know, like a coach with the football team, rugby team, you know, to get the motivate the 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 the, the players to perform so they feel comfortable, they feel like a fired up or whatever you have to do. Um, but as make sure that the singer can be heard and the lyrics that you know what you're trying to say in the song. Let's get that across, even if it's just love, love me do, or. Um, you know, what, what, or what's about Bon Jovi title? Um, we're halfway there, living on a prayer. You know, like let's make sure everybody can hear that, and no, nobody's going like, "What did he say?" Living on a chair. I, you know, it's uh, yeah. So that would be my that would be the best advice I got from Mickey Mouse. Turn up the singer. Awesome. What inspires mm. you daily? What motivates you? that's a that's a good question because um my um my partner julie often says like why do you keep working you you can stop now and um and it's just uh, i'm lucky enough to have some talent and i wake up in the morning and um i can be on a bus or on a cycle ride and a song idea just pops into my head and um i i, I I don't know why that happens. I invite it, you know, it's not, um, 
it, it, sometimes it, I just go, oh, damn. Oh, see, I, sometimes you, it's kind of an inopportune moment. You're just about, you're walking down the street in a, a crowded street and you, you might see a sign or hear somebody say something and then you start singing. You go like, that's a cool phrase. Well, how, do, how would I sing that? And you start singing, and you go, that's actually quite good. And then the next thing, I've got my iPhone out, the little voice recorder. So you're walking down Oxford Street, you know, hundreds of tourists going past you, and you're singing kind of sheepishly into a phone because inspiration is strikes. Uh, and um, so that's what that's what uh, that's what keeps me going. You know, it's it's. Um, it's uh I'm, I'm really pleased that that happens that makes me feel so good that that, that uh you know i had that when i was 13 you know i'd write you know learn three chords and write a song and then then I, you know the idea would would come to me and and you know 40 years later it still it still happens so i don't know why you know um i just i i, I welcome it i welcome it yeah it's exciting. It's almost like being a kid at Christmas. Like when you get that initial idea, it's like unwrapping the present, you know, um, if you're lucky enough to get a present. But um, you don't know what's inside it. You don't know. You've just got this little idea and it's, you, you might listen back to a later and go, that is really rubbish, you know, super naff. Or you might go, oh, I know where this can go. I know what beat should go with that. Or, um, yeah, so it's just, it's not like, I have a, had a couple of moments where a whole song has kind of appeared more or less in my head just at once, which is pretty magical. Um, but usually you get, you get like, the universe sends you little segments of like ideas and then you have to work at, at trying to figure out uh, what the rest of it is trying to say. I'm making it sound a bit mystical. It's, it's, it's not really it's just work it's work you know hard work ain't nothing like it oh that's wonderful mate that's wonderful um what are your other hobbies and passions outside of music and on um, the songwriting and that what do you like to do in your downtime yeah um we we had a little chat pre pre broadcast and and you know like most uh kids um as a teenager, I, I was pretty fast. Um, and, um, I don't know. I want, I, I would have liked to have been a professional footballer, but as I say, I, I, I was, uh, I, I was, I was quite, you know, I was quick. Um, but, uh, there was only thing, uh, you know, like I was fit, had a great engine, but, uh, as I say, there was only one thing I lacked and that was ability. So, um, you know, um, I still play, yeah, getting back to the hobbies, so I still play five-a-side, do you call it soccer? Or soccer, in, we call it soccer. In, in the US, yeah. I mean, in Australia. Yeah, so um, I play with um, a bunch of guys my age and also some of our sons, and and it's just such a, you, you play this format called five-a-side or six-a-side, and uh, so I still do that. I do a lot of cycling um you know on a road race uh that's another big hobby i love going out for i only do that when the sun is shining though i'm a I'm fair weather cyclist i used to do i used to be a marathon runner in fact but um i stopped you know like um uh, i haven't done a half i stopped doing marathons quite a while ago and then i stopped doing half marathons maybe five years ago it just you start getting these messages from your knees going no mate the, the, those but uh i still love to play uh soccer um well uh, hobbies of uh, uh i guess that, that they're my main my main hobbies i'm addicted to the television i guess you could call that uh, i'll just put netflix on and find something i that's how i chill out really is is um and i read books I read books. I guess that's quite, uh, um, that's, uh, another, another way, uh, I relax. Yeah. That, so they're my hobbies. Yeah. Wonderful. Very wonderful. <laughs> where do you, what do you, what do you, what is the future? What does the future look like for you? What are you working on? 
Um, I'm actually working. I've just done, finished the second Astral Drive album and um, sort of doing some promotion for that. So, you know, shows like yours, uh, other podcasts, radio shows. Um, but I've actually, even though Astral Drive, uh, the, it is more or less a solo album. It's me playing the drums and doing the singing and playing the bass and the guitar and everything. Um, but I'm actually, do, I have another project, which is also a solo album, which will come out under my, uh, as Phil Thornalley, which is much more in a kind of, um, so I'm working on that album. That's more in a kind of traveling Wilburys. I don't know if you remember that group, kind of, um, it's very kind of lighthearted, um, more kind of, like pop rock with a Beatles influence, may, maybe, and and um, actually with orchestra as well. So it's quite it's quite fun, it's quite fun to do that. It's very different from Astral Drive, which is more kind of rocky. Um, it, it's much more, and the lyrics are fun. You know, it's uh, so I that's that will hopefully be released next year. This this solo album, but I'm working on that now. Um, yeah, I'm just lucky to to like feel inspired to keep going um this year also a friend i produced an album um on a friend of mine called chasm sultan uh, who's uh, has been in bands with meatloaf and and um hall and oats lots of uh, uh big american artists so i produced a solo album for him um it's nice when you can um he's a friend of mine so I tend to, the projects that I have coming up tend to be working with friends now. Um, record companies, um, I, I don't get the call from record companies anymore, which is, that's kind of cool. I got the call for 35 years. You know, I was someone they came to to uh, help them, you know, um, produce their artists or write songs for them. And then, um, but that, that, that um, I could still do that, but um, I, to be honest, I got kind of burnt out with um, with that process and and uh, started making my own, you know making my own music, Astral Drive or whatnot. Um, I feel much more passionate, much more honest about that. I'm making it because I really want to. I'm lucky enough that in my career, um, the records that I made sold. You know, some of them did so. There's a system in the music business where you get to what are called royalties, where you get paid, even though, say, I, I made a record with The Cure called Love Cats, which is now, you know, like 35 years old, but I still, uh, twice a year, I still get a check for the for the record. You know, not a big check, by the way, but um, so that's one advantage of having had a successful career is that I, I can now, hopefully not sound complacent but i can just enjoy myself a bit more and um as long as radio stations keep playing torn then um that that would be the case maybe next time we speak i'll be i'll be working i'll be driving a bus or you know something but hey wh whatever happens yeah that's I cool know. i think you've got a great life you know it's um it's amazing everything you've done where you're already going so yeah um yeah, Phil, thanks for the podcast, mate. Um, I do appreciate it. Um, it's been wonderful hearing all your stories and everything you shared. And I wish you nothing but the best um, in your career to date and for the future. All right, Nick, that's really kind of you. Thanks for uh, thanks for the questions. I hope you can make some sense out of my ramblings. And um, hopefully see you next time when the next album is out. 100%. Looking forward to it. All right. All the best. Cheers, everybody.